my inflammation markers, what it looks like to be on a carnivore diet for an entire year. LDL, HDL breakdown to my metabolic health, special guest, my friend, Nathan Owens. I think uh, it's it a risk factor, right, for heart disease? Yeah, it's associated. I am here with my friend, Nathan Owens. He and his partner, Nick, have created an incredible, I guess you want to call it a brand or organization team. And you guys are root causing health, right? Yep. Yeah. We have a podcast and a website and we're kind of a uh, organization of some sort that uh, is looking into the root cause of chronic disease, uh, mostly starting with cardiovascular disease. Awesome. I wanted to bring Nathan on the, on, on this video because People are interested in carnivore diet. It's, it's picking up a lot of momentum. I have now done three rounds of labs. In this most recent round of labs, I pulled in like basically early November, late October. And both Nathan and I are, are both personal friends of Paul Saladino, carnivore MD. And we both are also, Nathan was living in Seattle and he still is. And I'm from there. So we connected and it was clear to me that Nathan as an engineer and my background is electrical engineering. He has that scientific approach to looking at labs. So we're gonna go through my blood work together on the video. And then at the end, we'll talk more about some of the stuff that I've seen on your videos and your content, Nathan. And we can just tell people about the incredible work that you and Nick are, are doing or have kind of put together to help people better understand the whole lipid hypothesis and how maybe high LDL isn't necessarily a, a direct measure of heart disease and there's other risk factors and We'll just kind of look at carnivore and we'll go from there. Um, so sweet. I just shared my screen and what I did was I basically just said, Hey, I'm on carnivore for a year. Um, I want to get a fit. I just give me everything. You know, I was like, Paul, give me everything you can give me lipids, give me inflammation, look at metabolic. So we'll kind of blast through this and we'll come back and go through everything. But we have here kind of inflammation markers. We have my lipid panel. The, the particle sizes, we have uh, my metabolic stuff, my fasted insulin, my hemoglobin A1C, my homocysteine, we have my vitamins and supplements, my omega-3 index, and don't worry if you're on the video, we're gonna come back to all this and go through it slowly, but I wanna kinda give everyone a precursor to what we're gonna cover. Then we go through some routine panels around just, I guess you would call this you know blood sugar and, and some of the, the mineral, micronutrient minerals that I have, and then, into the renal function of my bun and creatinine and down here into my GFR filtration rate and then hormones. And so, yeah, Nathan, if you're, and then your thyroid and my ferritin, which we'll talk about at the end here, it was high. I just did some phlebotomy a month and a half ago because it was high and my white blood cell counts and platelets and my urine analysis. Should we start from the top, Nathan? What do you think? Yeah, let's start at the top and work our way down. Okay, cool. So uh, metabolic health. So M M my myeloperoxidase is MPO, right? That's basically the same yep, thing? that's MPO. And that's, okay. uh, it's a chemical secreted by white blood cells that's a sign of inflammation. Okay, uh, so... Neutrophils. Uh, I think it's it, a risk factor, right, for heart disease? Yeah, it's associated with... Uh, increased myeloperoxidase is, is associated with an increased risk of or increased occurrence of cardiovascular disease. Okay. Uh, and your numbers look great there. 179 is super low, along with your uh, next one, the HSCRP C-reactive protein. That's a kind of non-specific inflammatory marker that the liver produces, and uh, you're actually below the range that they can even measure there. So that's that's awesome. Now, you've done your own labs, right? And you've seen CRP as well. I have. Yeah, my CRP has varied a bit. Um, it can even go up just if you're exercising, for example. Um, so it's pretty variable. I think Nick and I are going to try and do like a 30 day, um, measurement, measuring it every day to kind of see what it looks like over time. But your numbers look great as a point in time snapshot. And just for reference, people on the channel that have followed me, I did a round of labs back in, uh, I think it was June and my CRP was higher. It was like 2.7 or 2.8. And Paul and I were like kind of scratching our heads going, what? what is this? We put the video up in like October um, and we couldn't quite pinpoint it, but we think maybe um, my sleep wasn't quite optimized and I might've been slightly overtraining. So anyways, it's good to see that it went down because it was kind of yeah, scratching our heads. I'm glad we started with these because I think 
inflation is one of the most important things to look at. Um, and there's even, if these numbers are elevated, there's other markers you could test, like uh, like more specific inflammatory markers like IL-6 or TNF-alpha to try and get a better idea of what's going on. But your numbers look great. And I think, you know, inflammation is key to a lot of metabolic issue and uh, autoimmune diseases and all of that. So it's good to see these low. I agree. What, uh, what do you make of the F2 isoprostane creatinine? I talked to Paul about this and we thought maybe it had to do with the elevated ferritin we'll get to down below. So I don't have a good handle on this. F2 isoprostanes are generally supposed to be a marker of oxidative stress, but this is actually the F2 isoprostane to creatinine ratio. And they don't actually provide a, uh, a reference range for the F2 isoprostane on its own. And it could be the case that just because you're muscular or you're eating a lot of protein that you have higher creatinine, which would lead to an unfavorable ratio there. Which is, is kind of interesting because I, I was fairly ketogenic on this. So I think my, my macro for protein didn't go much beyond 30% of my caloric intake. So That's I wouldn't still say more like, than your, your average American. So it's, it's difficult to tell. I think I'd have to look into that one a little more, but I, I wouldn't be too concerned about it. Okay. Well, what do you think of this though? My total cholesterol is off the, you know, off the reference range here at 303. That's, yeah, that's I think fine. 303 is pretty all right. Uh, mine has read over 500 multiple times. And I think, you know, if folks want to go check out Dave Feldman work, Feldman's work or myself and Nick's work around uh, cholesterol, these numbers look really good. Your HDL is high, your triglycerides are low. Um, you have good re ratios there. Your TG to HDL ratio is 0.8, it says there. Um, and that's a great ratio showing insulin sensitivity. Um, so I think given the rest of your numbers, I, I wouldn't worry about an LDL of 200, which is not really that high for someone as like a lean mass hyper responder type. Now in my, in my book on the carnivore diet that I wrote, I, I kind of mentioned like my understanding is if fasted triglycerides are elevated, that's something to kind of go, okay, well, maybe there's something here with some metabolic syndrome that's creeping up on people and, and can also be sort of a risk factor of, of, of things to look for. Yeah. I think it's important to look at the combination of HDL triglycerides, insulin and glucose and kind of put together the puzzle there of what's going on. It can be the case if you're doing like a higher fat uh, like keto AF uh, approach where you're eating, you know, large quantities of fat, yeah, you may have residual triglycerides for a longer time. Um, but you know, under a hundred is, is good. And, 61 is great. So I think that those numbers look good and that's where I'd want to see them. Okay. When you think about LDL, and I know you've done some work on this too, I think with your, your guys' stuff, LDL, I've heard studies and I haven't looked into them where it's actually, it can be protective in older populations as they age. Uh, have you seen studies about that too? Yeah, that's definitely shown up in a, in a few studies. Um, you know, folks will claim thing, you know, reverse causality or selection bias, but um, there's definitely something there that in older populations, it seems like uh, having a higher LDL is uh, not detrimental at the very least um, and potentially protective. Okay. How about with the MMR? So that's nuclear magnetic resonance. That's basically when they, they're able yep. to, to pull the labs and because these particles are like, they're, they're microscopically small, they're tiny and there's millions of not, you know, uh, there's actually, there's a lot more than that many. There's uh 10 to the 17 to 10 to the 20 of these. So there's, there's uh, billions and billions of quintillions. Yeah. It's huge numbers. Okay. So um, there's just like tiny little, there, there's much, a, a ton of them. And so they have to yeah. go in and do this NMR to look at the particle counts. And, uh, do you glean anything from this on my labs? Does it like sound out at anything or is it more the major stuff that you look at first or what are your thoughts? Um, on I think that it's, it's a little interesting to look at. I'm not really sure what to take away from it. I've, you know, the small LDLP generally people like to see that low because it's generally considered the case that, uh, an increased amount of small LDL particles is associated with atherosclerosis and heart disease. Um, you have a low number there. That's good. Um, but given, you know, if you have more LDL, you'll likely have more small LDL. So I think that, you know, something like the ratio there is probably more important. Uh, you want to see large LDL. You have large LDL there greater than 20.5 nanometers. Um, your HDLP, which is the particle count of HDL, is crazy high, about where mine was as well. And you have tons of large HDL, which is 
associated with better, uh, lower risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, and the, like the LDL size is tends to be associated with insulin sensitivity, lower blood glucose, things like that. Okay. Got it. So just to kind of put things in perspective, if I say this right. My understanding is LDL is low density lipids. These are lipoproteins in the bloodstream that help move around fat in the blood, kind of like oil within water. And yep. yeah, so it's a, it's a protein and fat shell around, uh, a cargo of triglycerides, which are three fatty acids that just attached to a glycerol backbone. Uh, okay. and those are wrapped up in these special proteins called apolip or apoproteins. Um, okay. Or lipoproteins. And then on the surface of that, you have different signaling proteins called apoproteins that signal what that's, that is doing. So for example, on LDL particles, VLDL particles, you have an apoB with lipoprotein B, uh, which is also a measure that you can count. And that's generally considered more accurate because it also includes remnant lipoproteins, which are bad. You don't want to have lipoproteins floating around for a long time in your circulation. Um, and it also counts VLDL, triglycerides, chylomicrons, and stuff. And then you have APOA, which is attached to HDL, high density lipoproteins. Um, and then you have also other ancillary ones like APOC3. Which I, I think we have these in the labs. So the, the high density, let's call them boats, right? The high density shuttles in the bloodstream of HDL, high density, hence HDL. That's, is that coming out of the liver and delivering energy and, and things like a fat, fat resource? Uh, that's the, the other way around. So oh, the way LDL around. is secreted from the liver and then that turns into LDL once the cargo is removed and then it circulates back to the liver. Uh, HDL, I believe, is also produced by the liver. Most of these things come from the liver. Some of them come from the gut when you're eating fat um, in the form of chylomicrons and VLDL. Um, but HDL tends to do what's referred to as reverse cholesterol transport. So it will take cholesterol that's in excess from cells and okay. redistribute it around the body. They have tons of other functions too in the immune system, um, as does LDL. So these things are not serving singular purposes. They also carry around um, fat soluble vitamins, vitamin D, vitamin K2, vitamin E, um, CoQ10, and other things. Uh, and I would recommend checking out Dr. Uh, Nadir Ali's videos on that. He has okay. some good videos about all the functions of lipoproteins beyond um, being something to look at on lab values. Um, there's a lot going on there. I think the the historical kind of like trending thoughts around cholesterol is that LDL when it's elevated is scary to doctors because they, they see that sort of correlation with people who have like metabolic syndrome having elevated LDL and it can be oxidized and it can kind of collect up in their artery arterial walls in, in the endothelium and the LDL when it's elevated, they're like, Oh, this is good. Cause the L uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. The HDL when it's elevated is kind of like the boat, the boats that are, are collecting the LDL and bringing it back like out of the system. Is that, is that somewhat They're of collecting a... the cholesterol and bringing it back? Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, let's move, let's move on. Um, so down here, we have a little bit more going on here. HDL size, VLDL, very low density lipid lipoproteins. Uh, that's also, I guess, a reference range there. And then my size of my VLDL. And I've seen some, some people talk about how going into like the lipid hypothesis even more as far as how cholesterol affects cardiovascular health. It's more important to look even more specifically at what the size of the particles within you looks like. So here's lipo A you were mentioning earlier. Uh, what do you think of these numbers and, and your thoughts on them? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not as familiar with the HDL size, but evidently yours are, are in the good range, um, much lower than um, their reference range. And you have very low VLDL, which makes sense if you were fasted and you're in a fat metabolism, you don't have a lot of excess, you know, fat looking to get stored somewhere floating around. Uh, and then lipoprotein little a, as that's referred to, is another, it kind of looks like LDL, but it has this tail on it, um, which is a varying length depending on your genetics. Um, and it's kind of weakly associated with cardiovascular disease if you have increased lipoprotein A. Um, Siobhan Huggins, who works with Dave Feldman, has a lot of uh, interesting research on lipoprotein little a. Um, I'm not really sure what to make of it, to be honest. I think that it's 
kind of a wash. I think it's just, it's just a thing that's there and some people have more of it and some people have less. <laughs> and that's, you know, we'll, we'll see. There's a lot of research going on right now. It definitely has impacts in like wound healing and repair and immunity. Um, so there's a lot going on there. It's potentially the, the case that the little tail can catch oxidized lipids or oxidized like is proteins. It, is this the same thing as APOE? No, totally okay. different thing. Okay. All right, cool. Anything else worth commenting? I think you kind of covered these. I mean, as no, I don't think so. I think, uh, you know, the, the advanced lipid panel is interesting, but I think, you know, if your normal lipid panel looks good, I don't think there's a huge amount to be gleaned there necessarily. Cool. Um, okay. Moving down here to metabolic. I feel like this is something a lot of people want to look at and, and get a feel for, you know, from my perspective, blood sugar, I thought it was pretty solid. I mean, I'm eating a yep. pretty fat heavy diet, but I don't want super low blood sugar. I want my body to have blood sugar to utilize it for energy and working out and just having functional energy. And, and that's probably happening through the glycolysis of the fat that I have in my body and gluconeogenesis of the liver producing the, the glucose that I need. Yep. Yeah. Your liver is always going to produce uh, adequate uh, glucose if you're eating even, you know, some modicum of protein and fatty acids. Um, so 79 is great. Uh, I think, you know, if you fasted longer, you'd see lower, maybe down into the sixties, but that's about where it would settle even for a, a long, long fast. So I think that's great. Uh, insulin of less than one. That's awesome. Super low insulin, uh, when you're fasting, although it's interesting to note that pancreas actually releases insulin on like a periodic fashion. So if you measured it every minute, you'd see a, a swing of about a hundred percent. So it's possible that if you waited, you know, four minutes, you would see that your insulin was like two or three or something. Interesting. If you measured again, it was less than one again. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Your HbA1c that measures um, roughly the uh, the uh, glycation of your red blood cells. So that tries to measure your average glucose, which they're then imputing down there, which says 105. Um, and that can be affected by things like your red blood cell lifetime, things like that. Um, that looks good to me. You know, 5.3 is good. Um, TMAO, that's a, a new recent devil that has come up as a risk factor for cardiovascular disease or it's associated with cardiovascular disease. And I'm not really sure what to make of your measurement here. Generally produced in the microbiome and can be found in eggs and meat and fish. But, you know, if you look at the research, it's beneficial when it's in fish and it's not when it's in meat. It's like, ah. Uh, seems kind yeah. of fishy to me. I've, I've, I've seen that, no pun intended there, but it's like, I've seen that too. Like, and I know uh, people like Dr. Gundry have really uh, almost like, you know, demonized it and said, Hey, you don't want high TMO. Like be really, be, be really careful about that. And, and then you look at some of the foods that contain some of the most amounts of TMO. And then you look at like fish and you're like, well, fish is really good for you. So, or at least we, we see correlation with fish being really healthy cardiovascularly. So it's like, uh, is it really TMAO like supposed to be something you're yeah. really worried about? And then like generally, if you dig into the research even more, it looks like elevated TMAO is associated either with kidney dysfunction or uh, insulin resistance. And in this case, this could just be a fluke. This could be diet related. Like I really don't know what to make of this. I haven't seen too many other TMAO measurements done. I'm hoping to get mine done. I'm going to have Paul order me this same panel hopefully uh, so i can see what mine is and get back to you but not something yeah. i would be worrying about what, what about methylmalonic acid have you methylmalonic you acid that? not familiar with that one okay um, you're pretty close to the reference range i don't really know what they're looking for there that seems like a test that they've come up with that i don't really know what that relates to but uh i'll have to look into that maybe we can put a comment on the video or something uh, homocysteine homocysteine is uh, a big one right people people talk about this quite a bit in the carnivore community yeah that's another one that's that's associated with cardiovascular and metabolic disease risk um generally that's because of having uh insufficient uh folate or vitamin b12 which you have below um and, and then this can be related to the the mthfr gene if you have uh if you're homozygous for six seven seven t i think which we call it gene mutation, you could end up having very high homocysteine because you don't properly methylate things. But yours looks great there. Coenzyme Q10, that's 
uh, used in the electron transport chain of the mitochondria. So it's important to have a lot of that so that your mitochondria work effectively. Um, here's is off the charts, so that's great. Uh, folate looks good. You get that from eggs and meat and stuff. Vitamin B12, you're obviously getting plenty of that. No absorption issues there, it looks good. Um, vitamin D, you got plenty of that. I guess you're getting sun or supplementing. Yeah, I do. I do take an effort to get the sun. And fortunately, I'm in Austin, like the southernmost capital city in the United States. So we have a, a good, uh, good angle for the sun down here, even in the winter months. Um, homocysteine, is that affected at all by like glycine? Do you, do you know if like, because I've heard like glycine to like, um, um, not aware. Okay, I don't, don't think okay. so. But I couldn't tell you. I have heard that folate does affect that too. And if you don't have the right balance yep. there. That can be a, a yeah, you want, uh, if you have high homocysteine, you want uh, pre-methylated vitamins as a supplement. So like uh, methylfolate and methylated B12, you can usually find those supplements online. That'll help bring down your homocysteine. And for those that are tuning in for the first time or looking at this round of labs, I've done my uh, homocysteine and my CoQ10 before and also my D and my B12. Those have, n numbers have been good. I do make an effort to get some sun, but uh the, the, yeah, these numbers are usually really strong, especially CoQ10. I've noticed on carnivore, like I must be getting it from the meat because there's just, oh yeah, it's, I have, it's a, robust, meat, so that's, I have that's, a robust amount. I've seen uh, Paul's labs. I think he tested that. I think I tested that once and it was pretty high. So um doesn't surprise me. That's, there's, that's in animal products and you're getting tons of it. And then back to your point on uh, hemoglobin A1C, HbA1C up here on the top. Um, I have heard people talk about red blood, blood cell, red blood cells living longer in a, in a carnivore diet and that can heard similar. And I'm not sure how we could verify that, but it would seem sensible. And, and it's not like your numbers are crazy. I mean, I would expect maybe a little lower, but I've seen mine fluctuate by, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, something like that. But it, it could be an indicator for someone who does labs that, Hey, you know, maybe it's not a diabetic concern, but you know, you'd have to look at everything in context, but yeah. I mean, if you're up at 5.7, I'd be a little concerned, but less than that, you know, if you're, if you're testing your own glucose at home every once in a while and it doesn't look crazy, and, you know, I think it's maybe it may actually be a sign of increased red blood cell lifetime or something. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the omega three fatty index? That's another one that Paul and I were kind of talking about and just like, you know, what's the right balance or, you know, what do you do with all this? And my arachidomic acid was obviously quite a bit. I mean, it was pretty, pretty well with the ref. I mean, they're all well with the ref reference range, but yeah, I, I get you curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So I'm not as familiar with this particular test. I've done mine a few times with a company called Omega Quant, where they send you a little postcard and you bleed on it and they actually look at um, the fatty acid composition of the red blood cell membrane, whereas this one is doing uh, whole blood. So I'm not quite sure how these compare, but you know, these numbers look good. Um, you know, I, I personally eat a lot of fish, um, sardines and, you know, not king mackerel, but other smaller mackerel, sam you know, wild Alaskan salmon. And my mine get pretty high. I was in the 99th percentile for uh, omega-3 omega fatty acids. And it's pretty interesting to look at. Omega Quant actually gives you a full breakdown of all of the fatty acids. So you can actually see like how much... Uh, you know, oleic acid versus stearic acid versus whatever else is in your red blood cells. And that's your body kind of plays with that to get where it wants it. If you provide all the necessary materials, uh, it won't necessarily be directly dictated by what you eat, but um, it looks like if you get sufficient saturated fat and sufficient omega threes, your body really likes using them. And I've noticed that I'm essentially sunburn proof when I'm getting sufficient omega threes, which is pretty cool. Yeah, you know, Paul doesn't that. think that they're super interesting, but I, I'm, I think getting it higher is, is better. I think yours look good, but I, again, I don't really have much to compare it to on this particular lab's values. Yeah, it's kind of one of those things. I think, you know, when I've talked with Paul, he, he has the concern around the quality of the, the, the cleanliness of the seafood and like what you're getting from the diet on the, the, the heavy metals, the trade off there. Yeah. But you know, I think that's a little overhyped because I was eating a ton of uh, sardines and mackerel and salmon when I've tested my mercury and lead and I, I got nothing. Like my values were super low. Yeah. Do you, and you do don't you, have to eat a whole lot. Like one little can of sardines a day is about all I was doing. And that gets you two or three grams of omega threes a day. Nice. Nice. What about arachidonic acid? Do you have any, any thoughts on that? 
that one's found in animal products. That's a, an essential omega-6. I, I don't have much. I, I think you're, you're going to get the quantity that you need from eating animal products. It's not one that I think about much. Okay. okay. I think if you scroll down, your actual, that was the ratio, but your actual arachidonic acid is down there. It says it's high, but you know, I, I don't really know what to make of that. <laughs> I think that's probably fine. Your linoleic acid was low. That's good. You don't want a ton of that, but you're going to get some. So I think that that's, that's probably fine. What are your thoughts on conjugated, congelated linoleic acid? I, I've heard, you know, people talk about that being sort of a unique linoleic yeah, acid. Yeah, that one's that more- uh, found. So that's, that's a, yeah, all these things have confusing biochemistry names. So CLA is uh, fairly different from linoleic acid. Um, and that one's found in dairy products generally. And it tends to be associated with decreased risk of, atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. Um, so I, I guess it probably good. I don't, I don't really know what to make of it. I looked into that research at one point, but I wasn't able to come to any great conclusions. Got it. Got it. Okay. So we have non cardio metabolic, I guess. So routine panels, glucose, calcium, anything. Yeah, I think these are, these are kind of bog standard. Um, there's not a whole lot to take away from these. I mean, your, your bun is good. Your creatinine is good. Um, the ones to kind of look at are like the, uh, ALP, AS, uh, AST and ALT. Those look at uh, liver function. So yours look good there. Those, those ones are liver function tests and those look good. Um, okay. Gotcha. Liver proteins. Okay. okay. Um, here's AST, AST right here. Yep. Asp- Asp- uh, and it looks like yes, your, yes your sample was hemolyzed, meaning some of the red blood cells broken down. So could be a problem there, but looks fine. Bilirubin, that's fine. Some people can have uh, excess bilirubin from Gilbert's disease. You don't have that, so that's fine. Your EGFR, they look at your creatinine and your bun to estimate um, how, your how functional your kidneys are. Um, your kidneys look very functional, 110 milliliters a minute per surface area of your body. Magnesium looks good. Uh, Cortisol is kind of tricky because of uh, timing, but yours looks fine there. Um, Yeah. DHE sulfate seems fine. Estradiol. I don't know why that would be low, but that seems fine. I mean, I'm guessing you're just not eating stuff that has, you know, hormones in there. FSH looks good. LH is in range. All of these uh, testosterone is pretty high. Free testosterone is good. Percent free. Wouldn't really be too worried about that. Um, Didn't you say, Nathan, there was there was like an insulin correlation with one of these? The- yes, that's sex hormone binding globulin, yeah. But okay. my guess is with the, the testosterone, like you have plenty of free testosterone and plenty of regular you know, bind, bound testosterone. So my guess is that on uh, you know, a carnivore diet, it's possibly the case that your sensitivity to testosterone is increased, so you don't actually need as much. Um, that, that would make sense. still within the reference range, so no issue there. Sex hormone binding globulin, SHBG, is uh, correlated with insulin sensitivity. So the more insulin sensitive you are, the higher your SHBG will be. Which I would imagine is a good thing, metabolically speaking, right? I think it's just the thing that is. I don't know how much there is to it. So, I mean, that's your testosterone ends up being bound to this protein. Um, I don't really know what to make of it. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably a good thing. And it's just a thing that happens when... It's one of these things where like probably the reference range sucks because everyone in the U S is metabolically ill. Uh, <laughs> so it's just like a, you know, it is what it is. It's probably fine. Okay. Albumin. Is this what they test for kidney function? Uh, that can be associated with kidney function. I think it's just a general measure of like protein in your blood. That was yeah, I think that's that right. from above from your, um, the, the panel here. Um, it'll be I in think- there. Albumin and globulin. Right here, the four point two, two of the main proteins in your blood. Uh, okay, they they should all this stuff should be boring. They're not testosterone, but all of your comprehensive metabolic panel should be pretty boring. It's stuff that's tightly regulated homeostatically. Um, so if you see that stuff out of whack, you've really got something going wrong. Okay, and most people shouldn't see any problems there. TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Um, I know yeah, that the thyroid stuff gets really complicated and I'm looking forward to uh, Peter Atia putting out like a whiteboard session video about thyroid hormones. Cause there's a lot of back and forth thing between like 
the liver, it produces T4, and then it gets converted back to T3, and then there's bound T3, and free T3, and free T4, and so TSH is what the pituitary gland secretes to stimulate the production of other thyroid hormones, like which are T3 all, and T4. Which are all and listed then, here. Yep. You can see my, my T3 like, is low, but I've, I've consistently tested low on T3 on a ketogenic diet. Yeah, and that's, that's seen on a ketogenic diet. There's a good blog post by uh, Verda Health about uh, low T3 on uh, ketogenic diets. And I think my, that's just my another, sister. My suspicion no. is your body just gets more sensitive to that hormone. Yep. And you're, you're not overeating calories, so it doesn't need to increase it. And, you know, it's probably just a, a nothing. T- but all these other values are within range. So not a lot to, to look at there. The, GG- uh, the thyroid antibodies are interesting. If people have elevated antibodies, that can be a sign of uh, autoimmune thyroiditis. Interesting. Uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, sorry. Okay. Um, okay. That, that's your immune system attacking your thyroid. You don't have that, so that's good. Uh, but, and then GGT, that's a, a sign of liver damage or general oxidative stress. So that's good to see that low. Got it. What, what's your take on iron and ferritin and all that stuff? Have you tested yours? And I have. I haven't seen it that high. Um, mine's generally been in the 280s, 300, something so like I, that, two, 250 to 300, I think. So it's I have higher, a, but not high. I have a genetic polymorphism. I think that's the right term uh, where I'm a carrier for hemochromatosis. Um, I'm also a carrier. Um, okay. So you shouldn't necessarily see if you're just a carrier, um, probably shouldn't see that, but, but I don't know, ferritin is also a, uh, your other inflammatory markers are low, but it's also the case that ferritin is a uh, acute phase reactant. So if you have a inflammatory state going on, you can see increased ferritin as well. Um, there's something like bacteria, like iron or something. So your body like pulls it all away so that it's not accessible by bacteria or something like that. Um, okay. But in this case, you know, if you do see high ferritin, keep an eye on it and you can lower it by donating blood as you did. Um, so that's a good move. Yeah. I'm going to do another round of, of blood donation probably in the next month and then re in a month after that and just see what happens to everything here. Um, Cause I haven't, phlebot- I haven't done phlebotomy. F- I- at least 10 years. So it's possible that oh, I just add some, yeah. some buildup. And I think I, I have a suspicion. If maybe, you hadn't done it in 10 years, it's, it was this high um, in your first set of labs too? I don't know if we tested it. I can't remember. So I'm not 100% sure if we actually saw it in the, in the first round. Because it could be the case that you've just had high ferritin for a long time due to your previous diet. Um, yeah. Because under a, you know, an optimal metabolism, uh, iron regulation in your body is super tightly regulated. You have transporters in your intestines that uh, only take in iron when you actually need it. Interesting. Uh, and, and that can be dysregulated in metabolic dysfunction. Okay. What is TIBC? Are you familiar with that? It's uh, total iron binding capacity. So that's how much iron you can uh, bind to your red blood cells. And okay. it says that your sample was hemolyzed. So those may be off, but those look within range anyway. So okay, fine. So we get down to the blood, the blood itself. Sadly, it looks like you had some fibrin clots in your sample, so they weren't able to test your white blood cell count, but your red blood cell count was good. Hemoglobin was good. Hematocrit's fine. Uh, and then you have the mean cell volume, the mean corpuscular uh, something or another. I forget what they stand for. Uh, your red cell distribution, with, that one's associated with uh, mortality. So you want to have a lower red cell distribution with yours is on the lower end. So that's good. Interesting. I think I had a lower white blood cell count in my last round of labs. And I was talking to, to Paul about it. And uh, he said, uh, maybe if your immune system isn't activated, you might have less white blood cells. Yeah. My, red, wet, bleh, my white blood cell count is pretty low generally. And I think that's, um, that is a, you know, your body's just not really, busy doing anything with the immune system. So it doesn't need as many white blood cells floating around. That makes sense. Um, platelet count, mean platelet, automated difference. It's like they couldn't test those. Yeah. Well, too bad. Um, urine, so glucose, this is probably, what, like, what are you looking for in urine? I guess 
like kidney function and like anything that kind of comes through there? Yeah. I mean, you're looking for like the reason like glucose, bilirubin, ketones, et cetera, would indicate either like if you're, if you're peeing glucose, you have diabetes. Um, if you have, you know, bilirubin is probably a sign of like kidney damage ketones. They'd be looking for diabetic ketoacidosis potentially, um, blood in your urine. Obviously that's, that's no good. So you don't have that. Um, Urinary protein, that can be a sign of kidney damage, I believe. Yeah, because uh, they would recycle the protein if they were functioning properly. Yeah, more so like man. there's, you're, you've got nothing to write home about here. Like, yeah, you're in ketosis, you're pee in ketones, that's fine. Your pee's slightly acidic, but not crazy, still in the range, that's fine. Um, because ketones are acidic, so they're, they're you know, beta, hydro, beta hydroxybutyric acid is one of the forms of um, ketones. You have no uh other cells hanging out in your pee so that's good no <laughs> leukocytes no white blood cells no red blood cells no other weird cells no bacteria so that's good you don't have a urinary tract infection or anything weird going on <laughs> um, so that's good um heavy metals so we just did a little heavy metal to kind of see if there's anything in there um didn't do a test couldn't do a test um for that um arsenic was below the reference range yeah, mercury, mercury below the range. Mer mercury below the range. Zinc, zinc is fine. You actually want decent zinc. Um, I don't know why they listed that again, but yeah, lead, that's good. Arsenic, lead. Um, not looking paint chips or anything over there. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunate. Okay, and then this just kind of breaks down the labs. So yep. it kind of helps people understand um, more details on how they pulled the labs, essentially. Uh, and then how they did the calculations for the, some of the lipid panels. So anything to write on me or any, any notable things on, on these labs as far as carnivore or what you would take away from any of this? I mean, I think your labs look great overall. Um, you know, I'd see what you can do with uh, therapeutic phlebotomy to get that, uh, get your uh, ferritin down. And then I'd see like skip phlebotomizing for a year or six months and see if it actually goes back up to a high number. My guess is that it will not. Um, my guess is that it will remain stable at a, you know, 200 to 300 level, which is totally fine. And then, you know, you should donate blood just because donating blood is a nice thing to do, but I'd be curious <laughs> to see, uh, you know, if that stabilizes. Yeah. I'm curious too. And I, I mean, I guess the F2 isoprostane creatinine kind of, makes me scratch my head. I'm not really sure what would happen there. Maybe it is the elevated ferritin that was kind of throwing that out of whack potentially. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for running through all that. I, sure. I think you did a much better job than I, I would have done. So Nathan, talk to me, um, or I guess share with me. So you've done carnivore yourself and you've done some of your own blood work. Is it? I have. Yeah. And what have have you seen similar, t is, does this see, kind of seen it, see a similar pattern with like, obviously with the lipids, you see higher cholesterol. You, you're a lean mass hyper responder based on Dave Yeah, Felt I fall into uh, the, the LMHR camp. So I see, uh, you know, my cholesterol, total cholesterol has been in the, you know, four to 600 milligrams of deciliter range. I generally see my HDL a little higher than yours in the nineties, triglycerides in the sixties to seventies. Um, my LDLP tends to be greater than 3,500, which maxes out the test. Um, I tend to see pretty high HDLP like you do in the 40s, um, high, large HDL, um, you know, generally in the same, same ballpark as you. Um, my insulin's been higher and lower. It tends to vary. I've seen it like below one and as high as like five, but I think that's the periodicity kind of thing going on again. Um, my ferritin last I checked was uh, 127 and then I donated blood and it was 26 <laughs> back down again. It was like so pretty low. Over 400. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my CoQ10 was actually higher than yours at one point. It was 3.02. Nice. Um, HbA1c, my last one was 5.3. Yeah, I mean, it, it all looks pretty similar. My CMP looks very similar since it's all kind of homeostatically regulated. Um, and yeah, as I said, my omega threes were pretty high because um, I try to eat a lot of seafood, and I had, didn't see any um, downside from that really. I mean, I'm curious to test heavy metals again, but on my last test, uh, my mercury was uh, four, and then down to three uh, micrograms a liter, and lead was immeasurable. So 
and you'll eat like a can of like those um sardines like a day and yeah i tend to do either some salmon or a can of sardines or a can of sardines and a can of mackerel i like to get the whole the bristling sardines the little whole fish um because i have some calcium in there from eating the bones and stuff okay yeah yeah i think i get the cans and they're in a blue container with the um the, the, the they wild come in, planet ones that you get the wild planet ones from yeah. pacific is that the same ones yeah, those you ones do? are good okay i use those ones and uh i do either uh i forget what the brand is but they're called bristling sardines they're little tiny ones they're oh smaller okay. than the wild planet ones okay um you get like 15 to 22 little fish in there um and they're pretty tasty nice and you do also you get a good bit of vitamin d from those as well that's pretty rad do you do you worry about the plastic and the aluminum like the casing and all that stuff i know paul's always harping on yeah that and it's I, like i seem to be doing fine you know, my hormones look fine. You know, I'm not really sure what we're worried about there, or what I should track. Um, you know, it seems like, uh, you know, on the Pareto curve of like the 80, 20 rule, like I'd rather eat the fish and get the vitamin D and the omega threes. And like, if there's a couple of nanograms of plastic bits in there, like whatever. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I can't win, win all the things. So <laughs> I agree. Um, cool. Well, thank you for doing that. Um, as far as, what you guys are doing, you know, what's your kind of elevator pitch for root causing health and like what you, what got you onto that? And, you know, tell, tell me, tell people about like what you guys do and what you're, what you're working on there. Uh, yeah. So my friend, Nick Andre, who I met at low carb Seattle, um, he was, uh, I ran into him and he was like the only person my age there in his twenties, everybody else is pretty old. Um, so I started chatting to him and he was telling me about this book he found, uh, and all these theories is about cardiovascular disease and how LDL was stupid and, you know, the existing hypothesis didn't make any sense. And I was like, oh, this guy's smart. He knows what's up. Um, so Nick found this book by a pathologist named Konstantin Velikin from uh, Romania. And he wrote this huge tome on atherosclerosis looking at pathology where he, you know, was, he was cutting up dead people who had died from heart disease and who had died from like being hit by a bus at all ages. So he could track the progression of the disease and he wrote this you know very well written well researched well cited book called a natural history of coronary atherosclerosis uh and he and i have just been kind of going through that book and synthesizing it with the modern research and all the studies that have come out recently and trying to put together a cogent picture of like what's actually going on um so as part of that we do a podcast um Nick put out a couple episodes called foundations, which kind of goes through in like 30 minute chunks. Um, some, you know, snippets from that book. Uh, and we did a talk at low carb Houston, which, uh, kind of goes through our hypothesis, which in short, which I'll, is that, I'll, we'll link in the video here. Cause it's really okay. good. It just kind of like condenses a lot of what you've shared with me on it. Yeah. So our basic hypothesis is that, uh, crappy food disrupts, the, the intestines and the stomach and the digestive system, um, both in terms of uh, junction permeability and the bacterial growth there. Um, and that leads to little pieces of bacteria and other stuff going through into the bloodstream. And that causes immune activation at specific points in the cardiovascular system, which leads to the development of atherosclerosis. Um, Have we, can we test those things? Like we test lipo polysaccharides, LPS, things like that in the bloodstream? So we're working on that. Um, that's kind of our next uh, experiment that we're going to do. Uh, it seems like because, you know, bacteria are everywhere, um, it's really hard to do that without contamination. So we're going to look at the downstream uh, immune triggers that those things activate uh, and see if we can test multiple of those. So our idea is to take uh, ourselves, um, somebody who's either diabetic or eats a crappy diet, and and then see what the difference is if we both eat like a standardized meal um, and see how much those increase um, and we're talking to you know researchers and other people on twitter and in the space and dave feldman and whatnot about other ways that we can try and validate this hypothesis or disprove it so if anybody has uh you know ideas of why this is a dumb idea please let us know as well Nice. Nice. Um, what's the best way for people to connect with you guys, learn about your stuff? Yeah. You should check us out on Twitter. I'm Nathan equals one and Nick is Nicholas, Nick Andre, I think. And we have our website rootcausinghealth.com, uh, where all that is linked. Um, and our Houston talk is linked. You can find our podcast. 
we're on all the podcast apps. We don't really release very often. We're, we're pretty picky about our guests. Um, we try and find kind of unique people who haven't been on other podcasts yet and who have, you know, very interesting and unique viewpoints. Uh, and we're just kind of busy because we both have full-time jobs. Uh, and, uh, you know, we kind of work on it as a little side project. So hopefully the next episode of Foundations actually talking about our hypothesis will be out uh, next week or so. Uh, nice. So you can look forward to that. No, I like it. And you're, you're 26 or 25? 27. Oh, you're 27. Okay. So, okay. And your background, you, you're, are you at Netflix right now or are you at Amazon? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a uh, systems reliability engineer, site reliability engineer at Netflix. Okay. And that's what you studied in college. You kind of like learned engineering. Yeah, I did uh, com computer science in college. Okay. Yeah. I think that makes it kind of like unique. It's cool to see engineers coming into the health space and like, especially when you're looking at labs and you're seeing all these molecules and how everything kind of fits in and, and, and yeah, I think the systems approach to, you know, like I'm, I'm dealing with complex black box systems that I really don't fully understand every day and I'm expecting to troubleshoot them and make them do the right thing. Yeah. Um, so kind of treating the body like that is, is certainly a way to go about that. And I think that the way that modern medicine treats it is, you know, a, a, a heart system and a brain system and a stomach system. And they're all looked at by different people and they don't talk to each other. This oh, leads man. to uh, some really bad outcomes and stupid research that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy what they do. They take, they take LDL and they go, Oh my God, it's, you know, it's, it's up here and like, you need to get on a statin and lower this. And it's like, no, like in the context of all these healthy metabolic markers and your body's just shuttling around more fat and you need it. And it's yeah, it's, it's wild, but yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, Dave Feldman's lean mass hyperresponder measurement project, which he's doing with uh, Tommy Wood. Who's oh, that's cool. At UW and with, uh, uh, Spencer Nadolski, who's also a doctor, and they're going to try and do uh, labs and scans on like 50 to 100 lean mass hyperresponders and follow up in a year and see if they have progression of atherosclerosis, which you would expect, you know, massive atherosclerosis if your LDL is five or 600. Yeah. I'm still kicking. So, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. <laughs> That's wild. Um, okay, history on carnivore. Have you been a carnivore for a while? Are you carnivore now? What's your What's your current? Uh, yeah, I've been carnivore since August 2018. I want to say so. Okay, coming up on two years, I guess. Yeah. Maybe okay. Something like that. Year and a half in. That's um, That's cool. And your experience has been good. Yeah, very good. I uh, I've had six pack the whole time, pretty much. So that's pretty great. Uh, nice. And, my digestion is amazing and energy is good. And did you have issues going into carnivore that you wanted to work on? Was there anything particularly bothering uh, you? Nothing, nothing so much. No, uh, I did keto first and that worked, but at a certain point I was like, why am I cooking broccoli? I really just like the meat, like <laughs> just more pans to wash. So you don't get uh, bored of eating meat all the time. Heck no. I look forward to it every day. <laughs> are you getting Bel Campo or US Wellness or a PCT out there? What do you, what do you do? For uh, I tend to just go to Whole Foods. The butchers know me there now and they hook me up with like fully untrimmed lamb loins and stuff. Nice. They're super fatty and uh, the ribeyes there are pretty good. Or occasionally I'll order from uh, Brian Sanders thing, mm -hmm. nose to tail or crowd cow or wherever else. Depends what I'm feeling. Cool. Cool. Any last thoughts uh, before we wrap? Uh, no. Cool. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I'm sure everybody on the, no on the video is going to really appreciate your, uh, engineering perspective on a lot of these labs and, uh, yeah, man, I'll, I'll send you the video when it's done and we'll, uh, we'll see how we can collab in the future, but I thank you so much, Nate. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, All right, no Nathan. Problem. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. All right, brother.